Bonjour à tout le monde. Hello everybody, my name is Heinrich and uh, I'm here to represent Denmark. Greetings to all. Today we'll be doing a quick presentation of our beautiful country, Bulgaria. Bulgaria is one of the oldest nations on the European continent. Hola, esto es Carla y me llamo Clara. Estamos muy contentas de estar aquí y uh, venimos con amigos del sur de Alemania, de uh, Munich. Je suis camera de tous les continents, membre du Parlement européen, professeurs. Bonjour à tous. And we go to a school, uh, a girls' school, uh, in Luxembourg. Uh, and so just imagine what it must be like going to a school with 1,500 girls. Might seem a bit strange, it isn't at all. Thank you very much. Hello, servus. Good morning. Bonjour. Buenos dias. Siastok. Salvete. In our school, all subjects are taught in English. And we indeed focus on languages and international relations. What you might know about Austria is that we rise like a phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We keep on struggling against all odds for our common European future, a future based on dignity, solidarity, and ancient Greeks' most important invention, democracy. We're from Croatia. I'm Dorothea. And I'm Patricia. And we would like to present you our country. But first, let us take a selfie. U Strasbourg, tamburica svira. U Strasbourg, tamburica svira. I ponosno naša srca dira, i ponosno naša srca dira. Možda mala, ali je pamet dala, možda mala, ali je pamet dala. Jedan, dva, opsasa! Really, it's a brilliant view from here, from the chair. Uh, to see so many people uh, coming from various countries of the European Union. And, uh, and uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, there are some Hungarian fellows, because I am uh, Hungarian, and uh, uh, if you don't mind, I would like to greet them uh, in my native language. Szervusztok, jó napot kívánok! Tegye fel a kezét, aki magyar, mert Oké, köszönöm szépen! Üdvözöllek benneteket, és... Uh, innentől kezdve akkor angolul folytatom tovább. Uh, greetings, my name is Preslav, I'm from Bulgaria. Uh, my question considers the environment more than anything else. Uh, so the European Union enforces a lot of policies on pollution and other bad stuff for the nature as a whole. But other countries in, outside of the European Union, which are rapidly de developing currently, uh, also start to pollute a lot and don't have such policies. So is there any way that the European Union can enforce our policies or similar to countries outside of the European Union in order not to pollute? Because we, as we all know, the environment isn't a regional thing, it's a global thing and it's a global problem. So is there anything that the European Union can do? If you allow me, I would link this issue to a recent initiative, uh, what are quite uh, quite frequently touched upon in various papers it is the so-called TTIP uh, uh, agreement the transatlantic trade and uh, uh, investment partnership program it's uh, uh, designed uh, something is becoming the major and basic agreement between uh, the United States and other uh, front runner in terms of environmental protection and uh, the European Union. But the basic idea is not only to have free trade and, and free investments, but there is one very important issue, namely to unify the various standards, industrial standards, production standards, evaluation standards, measurement standards, uh, and many uh, other uh, kind of standards. So if, if we equip uh, this TTIP agreement uh, with uh, those uh, 
uh, recommendations uh, or rules uh, which are uh, as such protecting and safeguarding the environment, then it's, it's a way which is offered to the other countries to follow. And those, those who will be not uh, able to uh, meet these requirements, they will lose the market. Uh, that's a, a, a opportunity uh, for everybody and, uh, and uh, I'm absolutely sure that uh, currently this is a very important uh, uh, initiative uh, by the developed, uh, most developed countries uh, to, to have a global impact uh, on, on, on those uh, areas, what, what, what uh, you just mentioned. You said that Europe is, the most, is in the best condition it could be. Is it in the best condition? Can we feel that it is in the best condition? I don't think so. I don't think so, sorry. I believe that we don't feel Europeans. We, we don't feel to be Europeans. We don't feel ourselves to be a part of a European Union that is strong and that is the best interest of everyone. I see the members of the European Parliament arguing about things politically, not in the basis of the good of the European Union and all the nations of which consist European Union, but just for political reasons. And that's my question. Why do MPs don't argue and try to find solutions for the problems of the European Union, because the European Union has many problems that do not affect only like Ukraine. Ukraine is out of Europe. Inside we have many problems. And you can say that I'm a Greek. But I believe that the MPs don't do the right thing. Why they don't take decisions for Europe, for the countries of Europe, for the people of Europe, and not for the politics. I can associate you because in my country, in Hungary, the situation is not much better than in Greece. But let's divide the issues. What is the blame of Europe and what is the blame of the individual countries? I am absolutely sure that our economic and political problems, what we are confronting in Hungary, any of it was created by Europe, none of it. All the problems what we have uh, now confronting in Hungary, it is really our responsibility. Our governments made the mistakes, our people made uh, wrong choices, and not the European Union. And Europe is not a, 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 a medical pill which, which, which cures every uh, illness. No, 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 Europe is an idea. But let's put your question in another way. Would you believe yourself more European if Greece would go out of the European Union? Definitely not. It's a chance. It's a possibility. But we humans, we, we are doing the, the, the wrongdoings. And the responsibility, of course, is much bigger uh, when we, 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 we uh, think on the politicians. But again, myself as a representative, as a uh, member of the European Parliament, formerly I was a member of the Hungarian Parliament, it's not only the things what I'm having in mind, what I put on the, the table at the various fora. No, no, no. I'm representing people. People are telling me what to say, what to do. And, and, and this is how you elect uh, uh, your politicians. And, and of course, politicians are having diverse views, which reflects that people are having diverse uh, uh, views. So uh, I don't know uh, uh, what to do in the case of Greece. Uh, if I knew I was the cleverest man in the European Union or, 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 or on the globe. Uh, but together, with the solidarity, with the assistance, uh, of the other uh, countries and nations uh, of Europe. I am sure that Greece will find uh, its, its solutions.
Yeah. Uh, thank you very much indeed. I am very pleased to be here with you today. I've only got an hour, though, so I don't want to give a speech. It's rather unusual, I suppose, uh, especially from where I'm sitting here. What I would rather do is give you an opportunity to ask your questions so that uh, you can talk about what you're interested in. So I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Good morning, I come from Germany. I have a question. Do you think there's too much of Europe sometimes in times of a crisis? Shouldn't we maybe just see, see what happens sometimes? And perhaps a accession negotiations should be somewhat delayed or taken more slowly. There's the cultural aspect, and maybe we should just make sure uh, that we uh, deal with that in the U EU as it is at the moment and not to uh, pursue accession negotiations so much with other countries. I think that it's important to carry on talking with other countries that want to join the EU. Now, personally, I would uh, urge that uh, we are be more uh, careful when defining membership uh, criteria, criteria that have to be met uh, for countries to accede to the EU. We have the Copenhagen uh, criteria. There's the question of uh, uh, economic uh, uh, capacity. Are countries economically uh, fit to be uh, members of the EU, then there are other criteria as, as well, as the financial uh, criteria, and that Turkey would like to join the EU. Uh, but uh, there, there is the question of uh, the freedom of uh, the judicial uh, system. There are res restrictions uh, in Turkey on that freedom that mean that Turkey couldn't, can't be taken up as a member of the EU. There's a question of uh, human rights as well, respect for minorities. All these are important uh, issues uh, that affect a country's ability to join the EU. So there's a lot of work still to be done. And I think that uh, we need to be working on both, working, working at both, really. We need to work within the EU with the members, but we also need to carry on talking to countries that would like to join the EU. We need, there has to be a contribution to further democratization of these states. We can exert a pressure on these countries who would like to join, you see, so that uh, they develop their democratic uh, values more so that they are then fit to join. As we know, now Europe is being surrounded by incredibly dangerous places. Middle East, North Africa, or Ukraine. These places are actually falling apart now. In those hard times, there was an idea of creating United European Armed Forces. Is that possible? And what role would they have in modern Europe? Thank you. This question of a European army, well, it's a, a part of the discussion about a foreign a policy, and there are a provisions in the Lisbon Treaty uh, for that. I have to say, though, that for me, it shouldn't be the focal point of foreign policy, but uh, one instrument that can be set up, and Jean-Claude Juncker uh, has uh, brought this uh, up, uh, and uh, instead of having uh, 28 uh, armies, it is felt by many that it would be better to have one army, that there would be synergy effects. You could send, save a lot of money. Uh, this week, I read that in the European Union, if we were to g count all the armies uh, uh, together, there's uh, some uh, 190 billion euros spent on those. So you could uh, reduce uh, the cost a lot by merging the army. But what kind of army would we be talking about? Uh, in uh, the EU, 
You see, there are many different uh, armies and many different uh, uh, approaches to armed forces and what armed forces can do. If you look at Austria or Sweden, uh, you know, there, those are uh, neutral uh, countries, but you've got France and uh, the United Kingdom, on the other hand. They have a, a different approach uh, as well and can send their armed forces to other places like uh, uh, Africa. And then on the other hand, you have uh, uh, Germany, where, uh, where the armed forces can only be used for defensive uh, purposes. So, so many different uh, approaches to armed uh, services, and that would all have to be harmonized, uh, really, if there were to be um, a constructive debate about what a European army would look like, uh, who would pay for it, uh, what uh, the role of the that army would be as well. So it would be a very lengthy process, and it's going to take uh, uh, quite a few years. But uh, the debate has uh, started, and we'll just have to see what happens, how that can all be organized. Um, as you just heard, the first question was about a change in behavior. We decided to educate adults by offering jobs to the unemployed, which would impact the environment so they could help out and provide them with a source of income. The second question was how we would encourage sustainable development. This would be encouraged through public transport, which would be made cheaper by the EU or by the local government through uh, lowered taxes which would encourage people to maybe ditch their cars and take the bus. Um, we would, you could also give benefits to green companies or car carbon neutral companies through tax breaks or special benefits when trading and tariffs. Also looking beyond Europe to the rest of the world for innovations in environment. Someone in the group suggested that uh, we use some form of biofuel because they use bananas in California. We don't grow many bananas here, but something similar could be used. And green bicycles. Uh, <laughs> as, you, as many of you may have seen in Strasbourg, they have bicycles to ride around on, which you can hire. And you know, it's in London, and I've heard they're in Denmark as well. And maybe people would, uh, people would enjoy using those. Uh, finally, just as a concluding point, these are pretty idyllic solutions and they would all require investment so they wouldn't all be possible but hopefully you know the environment's important and as many we need to do as many of these as possible thank you we had the topic 2015 european year of development even if we are in a financial crisis right now it is still our responsibility to provide help to third countries first we should try to solve our own problems in the UA European Union, and then continue investing in social facilities such as schools and hospitals. The amount of money we provide at the moment should not be increased, but we could control the way it is spent. One example can be that Europe, as a well-developed community, offers third countries benefits and trade. Another point would be that um, education is also a very important concern to us. Unemployed teachers from European countries could be ascended to third countries that suffer from no to bad education, and their salaries should be paid from the European Union. Eventually, our investments should be profitable for us, and in our opinion, third countries have to be, become independent one day. Thank you. Uh, issue number one is agriculture. Uh, we suggest creating funds to empower small farmers all over the EU and to further promote commercial farming in lesser developed regions of the, of the European Union, which would improve the economy of those regions and also create more jobs, which, be benefit, which would also benefit their economy. Moving on to our bigger issue, education. We have, come up, uh, we have come to the conclusion that it is a big problem that academic achievements, that is, diplomas, are not recognized everywhere in Europe. Let's say a Greek doctor's degree is not recognized as, as a doctor's degree in Austria. 
So our solution to this problem is to abolish a national curriculum and to implement a European one that is recognized in all of the EU. And further, we suggest that it would be a great idea to standardize European education to make sure every European Union citizen has equal opportunity to get educated. In addition, in order to establish EU-wide friendship, we, uh, we thought that it would be an amazing idea to promote school exchanges so that the European Union can bring two schools together. Because this is what Europe is about establishing friendship all over the continent. We also really want to give everyone freedom of speech, as long as it doesn't um, abuse or discriminate anyone. So uh, you can say whatever you like, unless uh, you're hurting someone. Um, also, freedom of speech gives uh, people more positivity and more uh, voting are, is, is going to be stimulating, stimulated because um, people feel more, more uh, yeah, connected to Europe and that can be a good thing. So, thank you. Our topic was migration and integration and probably for many of us this is a topic close to our heart. And to help enhance migration and integration we propose the following ideas. The first measure we present is the centralization of the migration process and the distribution of the refugees slash migrants according to the econo economic strength and the number of the population in the country. There should also be a housing program outside the big cities where the refugees would be placed while they are in their probation time and the chance, and the chance to have language classes. This will increase the integration with the population. Our last measure concerns the increase of the cooperation between the host country and the country where the migrant comes from, and this will help to improve the, the communication. Uh, I will divide the questions and the answers with my colleague, that is Carla, and it's on, in, over there. And thank you for hearing me, us. The first measure we came up with is the improvement of education in several ways. First of all, education must be the basis of every career. To achieve that, uh, we suggested that there should be equality of opportunity for everyone. Also, there must be unified studies that will accept pe people from different nationalities and also this will help to avoid discrimination. Furthermore, it will be useful if universities can communicate with employers so young people will find it more easy to move from education to employment. One of the main things that European Union must help is the university's fees. In many places of Europe, fees are very high that many students can't afford the cost of living while studying. So European Union must intervene to reduce the university's prices so more students will be able to study and got the necessary skills and knowledge that employers need. Another thing that we discussed is that it could, and it could be improved is about universities. Uh, that's it, to use, teaching, to use modern teaching methods that will offer more practice to young people so they could gain more experiences. On the other hand, employers must leave behind them stereotypes from previous years and be open-minded to hire young people so they would gain experiences and stop preferring to hire old people who have already gained experiences. Thank you.